Chapter 1. Some Terminology Deleuze was a post-structuralist, but he was not, as many presume, a postmodernist. Quote-unquote postmodernism is typically used as a catch-all pejorative to name the generalized rootlessness, fragmentation, and incoherence characteristic of Western culture today. Quote-unquote post-structuralism is often associated with postmodernism because they sound similar. Their most famous representatives are French, and they seem to have both kicked into high gear sometime from about the 1970s. As a result, most people who hear of post-structuralism assume it's a bunch of highfalutin French charlatans peddling absurd concepts. Names likely to be mentioned as exemplars include Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, and Gilles Deleuze. Thus, to the degree Deleuze rings a bell to normal people, it is a bell that sounds like postmodernism, rootlessness, fragmentation, and incoherence. It's a particularly unfortunate mistake, however, because Deleuze provides more possible exits from the postmodern impasse than any other philosopher since World War II. Post-structuralism refers to a cluster of quite diverse intellectual projects. All they had in common was a general drift away from the dominant style of the preceding period, structuralism, as exemplified by Claude Lévi-Strauss in anthropology, Ferdinand de Saussure in linguistics, and Louis Althusser in philosophy. We don't need a long detour into structuralism. Suffice it to say that the spirit of structuralism was proud, stodgy, and overly pleased with its own rigor, or rather, its aesthetics of rigor. Althusser, for instance, genuinely believed that Karl Marx discovered the science of history, on par with the discoveries of Galileo. The only way to avoid the traps of bourgeois ideology, according to Althusser, is to follow Althusser's voluminous, scientific, interpretive dictates. It was inevitable that some cheeky upstarts with poetic flair would eventually launch their own careers by deflating these stuffy windbags. Did I mention that Althusser murdered his wife? To be honest, none of this really matters, which is what matters. The label post-structuralist tells you close to nothing about what someone thinks. It might sound like postmodernism, but it's really just a vague stylistic tendency in France in the last third of the 20th century. Post-structuralists such as Foucault and Deleuze are now widely seen as quote-unquote cultural Marxists, thanks to a popular talking point by the Canadian psychologist Jordan Peterson implying that their philosophies are merely vehicles for class war. Yet, during the heydays of post-structuralism, figures such as Foucault and Deleuze were more likely to be seen as traitors to Marxism. Recall that it was not until 1956 that Jean-Paul Sartre, the most towering intellectual figure of 20th century France, finally disavowed the Soviet Union. Deleuze wrote his first book, on David Hume, in 1953. Post-structuralism was not an adaptive mutation of economic Marxism onto the cultural plane so much as a defiant assertion of autonomy and creativity away from Marxism. To propose an examination of quote-unquote reactionary components within the work of a left-wing post-structuralist is, when seen in this light, not as scandalous as my critics suggest. As I will try to show, the work of Gilles Deleuze furnishes a number of antidotes to the chaotic evils of postmodernism. There remains a widespread impression that Deleuze was a chaotic thinker, promoting absurd and ridiculous concepts to smash rigid and traditional norms. In fact, I believe Deleuze wanted to subvert precisely postmodern tendencies, for instance, the tendency to be distracted by arbitrary and fleeting fashions, or to be captured by marketers and algorithms. He wanted to cut through what he called all of our quote-unquote false problems to show that in every passing moment, there is only one pure, uninterrupted past working through us. The two meanings of reaction. Discussing the ideological valence of great thinkers is difficult because they have little use for the crutches of ideology. The difficulty is particularly acute today when ideological labels are used so loosely and often with ulterior motives. I should therefore clarify, at the outset, what I mean by quote-unquote reactionary in the subtitle of this book.
In some sense, Deleuze was explicitly anti-reactionary. He was anti-reactionary in the sense that he was anti-reactive in the spirit of Spinoza and Nietzsche. To be a reactionary, in this pejorative sense, means to be always responding to active superior forces instead of becoming an active force. To be captured by sad affects, to be resentful, and to think and act with these as one's motive forces. This common sense understanding of reactionism partially maps onto the modern political ideological sense of the word. The data show that conservatives are more reactive to disgusting stimuli, for instance. Experiments have shown that even just the presence of foul odors can make people slightly, but measurably, more conservative. Conservatives are more likely to see threats and reactively demand, quote-unquote, law and order. Edmund Burke watched the French Revolution with horror and famously wrote about his reactions. Henceforth, we'll refer to this aspect of reactionary or conservative politics as reactivism. I prefer reactivism to reactionism because it will remind us that left-wing progressive activism is much closer to the sense of reactionary than we are accustomed to thinking. Reactionary politics in this sense, reactivism, can be a failure mode of left-wing politics no less than right-wing politics. Things get confusing because modern society also calls reactionary whatever transgresses left-wing or progressive norms. Nietzsche, for instance, is seen by many as a reactionary, even though one pillar of his whole life's philosophy is a contempt for any and all reactive tendencies. From the 20th century, and especially after World War II, any sufficiently disagreeable and strong-willed individual eager to avoid reactivism, who wishes to constitute an authentic, healthy, and autonomous existence, will eventually be coded as reactionary. Even if their political beliefs are ideologically ambiguous or ambivalent. Thus, individual intellectuals as diverse as Ernst Jünger, the Italian futurists, Martin Heidegger, Salvador Dali, Jack Kerouac, and even Hunter S. Thompson would all eventually earn the distinction to varying degrees. Strong and uncompromisingly active drives get coded as quote unquote reactionary if the individual is not plausibly linked to the larger collective liberation struggle of some officially marginalized group. It is only in this sense of the term that we will find a reactionary component in the philosophy of Deleuze. This latter sense of reaction is a recurring subterranean tendency that can arise from the left as well as the right. It is most likely to emerge from the right, but in periods when the left becomes especially decadent, the responsibility to transgress the left will occasionally fall to an otherwise proper leftist. There is evidence that Deleuze was writing in such a context. Deleuze's first explicitly political book with Felix Guattari was published in 1972. Only two years later, under a well-documented deleuze guattarian influence, Jean-Francois Lyotard published what he would later call his, quote, evil book. Libidinal economy is arguably more favorable to capitalism than deleuze guattarian accelerationism. Adding insult to injury, Lyotard seems to blame the workers for their own oppression. One would need a whole book to fully explore all of the subtle currents of reactionary leftism in post-war European philosophy. Suffice it to say that Deleuze's reactionary leftism was not a random or isolated fluke, but rather comprehensible in its context, and even repeated to some degree by Lyotard.